What am I about to listen to? This is UK Hun on, from the, the British version of RuPaul's Drag Race. The United King Dolls is what it says here on, yeah. on YouTube. Okay. Um, I think our guest is about to pop in as well. So when they get here, they'll just have to try to catch up with what we're doing. What are we doing? Bing, bang, bong, sing, sing, song, ding, ding, dong. UK Hun. Dancing to a Highland chick, Lawrence Cheney's up in this gig from Helen's Bra to Edinburgh. Everywhere I go, I'm snatching wigs. I made my name in Glasgow City. Can't sing or dance, but I'm so witty. Me and my dolls are on a mission. Gonna take this great for Roo Roo Vision. I'm the fashion queen, a whore. I'll stick a ten through the door. When he's asking for more, tell me the oh, ain't a store. You read books and I'm on the cover. Stip star queen, just like no other. Turning out love, fashion star lover. Just like you. Hey, that's what's his face from the from the the show, not the guest judges from that show. <laughs> we made some Buddy Redmayne on. Oh, Miss Michelle Visage is on this one as well. Yeah, Michelle Visage, Visage, Visage. Visage, Visage. Visage, Visage. That's kind of the the thing that pisses me off about some of the versions of RuPaul's Drag Race is that Ru and Michelle will go to certain places, but not Canada. It is literally a train ride away for them. Like, what are they doing? Oh wow, they don't come for our show. No, but they go to Australia. They go to the UK. Maybe I they have felonies and they're not allowed in the country for some reason. <laughs> Michelle has come up for um, Canada's Drag Race a couple times, oh. but not Rue. Bing Bang Bong indeed. It's such a good song. Oh, wow. Somebody just jumped off a stool and did some splits. That's the magic of drag shows, is somebody's going to do some type of death drop. It's amazing. They put their bodies at risk. It's incredible. Sorry, a cat just walked up to the computer. That's it. The cat caused feedback. Mittens. She just wants to be famous. Whoa, what was that? Oh, that was a speaker turning off. Just oh. random electronics. <laughs> I like it. Digital world. <laughs> it's just going to be a bunch of random space noises this episode. I love it. Yeah, um, if we're lucky, the guy upstairs will sing some songs. Uh, lately, it's been show tunes but also a lot of um, I Will Follow You Into the Dark by Death Cab for Cutie. Oh. Yeah, so... Um, Maybe they'll sing something from RuPaul. <laughs> oh my gosh, I wish. I wish. Um, if there was a hockey game, you would hear it through the floor. Oh my god, we are lucky that there is not a hockey game tonight. The local team is in the final playoff, is in the playoffs. There are a lot of flags around. Uh, yes. Um, red flags, unfortunately, too. <laughs> Weird ones. Our team's sports color is red, um, which is alarming and should also uh, say something. It it definitely says something. How are you doing? I only saw you like, what, five hours ago? It, about that, yeah. Uh, I did not have a nap, so yeah. we're winning. <laughs> are you are you caffeine-free? No, gosh. Oh, I wish. Never. I just realized that uh, you didn't drink your, your Diet Pepsi at lunch. Which oh. was fine, because I drank it just now. I'm more aspartame-free. Oh, that makes sense. Aspartame's terrible. Yeah. At this point, I've already spread my seed, and so I see no reason to stop killing my, my spermazoids. Is that a myth, or is that real? My mom told me that it um, damaged your brain in ways that could not be recovered. Oh. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't believe it, but no, I don't think it is. But it was enough to keep you from ever drinking Diet Pepsi again? I don't really like the taste, honestly. Give me full sugar. I just want Diet Coke. Uh, and the reason is not because of sugar. It's because I like the taste of Diet Coke better than I like the taste of Coke. I just, Diet Coke is like the perfect sort of mix. Yeah, I'm there with you. Yeah. I miss Vanilla Coke. Mm, I'm a Cherry Coke person. Vanilla Coke and Cherry Coke, one of each. So neither of you are Pepsi people. No. Oh, no, we drink so much Diet Pepsi. It's Diet Pepsi and ch uh, Cherry Coke. Okay, That's it for the me. hierarchy, though. So your number one drink out of, like, colas, Lexi, would be Diet Pepsi? Pepsi. Or regular Pepsi. Yep. Diet Pepsi. Okay. 
it's just it's that it's I get like heart palpitations from too much sugar. So it's the it may or the caffeine. I don't know. I just get heart palpitations <laughs> and blame it on something. So better than going to the doctor. I blame my anxiety. Anxiety exactly. is also a good reason to have heart palpitations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I get heart palpitations when my child screams at me too much. <laughs> The important thing is our hearts are working for us, and that's what matters. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, in an alarming ways, but yeah, they are working. Yeah, I'm Diet Coke. That's my my poison. I quit it every now and again, and then I come back to it. I grew up in a Pepsi household, which I think is why I drink Coke. <laughs> Just a little rebel. This is interesting. This is actually super interesting because I also grew up in a Pepsi household, and my family was actually offended when I said I preferred Coke. Um Mm-hmm. But you bring up a really interesting thing because I actually came up in a very uh, like personality domineering household and things like that were determined at the like sort of family level, yeah. the macro level. Like you weren't, you weren't choosing those things on your own. This family likes X, this family does X. And so the entire idea of individuality and like making my own decisions was just like an affront to the entire group of people that I was raised with. Uh, and the first time I really saw that was saying, I like Coke better. Oh, well, you're just doing that to be different. Like, even if I was, yeah. Absolutely. But the idea of having like my own choice, is just, it was wild that that was such a fucked up thing for everybody. Um, yeah, I like Diet Coke now. So I'm basically antichrist. As you know, he will return when the soda cracks open and is full of aspartame. It's one of the signs of the apocalypse. <laughs> Which horseman is that? Uh, aspartame. <laughs> the red one? The rider on the uh, silver and red can. Yes. Just like crushing cans and burping. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And the Lord opened the fourth seal and upon the horse of aluminum <laughs> was the rider aspartame. And in his hand, he carried, I don't know, a brown soda known for giving kidney stones. Ah, uh, it's good to laugh. <laughs> The Book of Revelations, according to Ben. <laughs> it kind of beats the original, honestly. I'm not mad. I mean, the original is pretty, pretty wild. It's a pretty <laughs> interesting read uh, if you want to just approach it as like fiction and not prophecy. Read Good Omens. You don't have to go through the Bible. Just get the Terry Pratchett, Neil Gaiman version of it, and it's fine. My interpretation mostly comes through supernatural, so same. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another good way to approach it. Yep. What's another way to approach the book of Revelations that isn't uh, reading the Bible? 2016 election. Yeah. How would the Republicans say it? <laughs> yeah. Are we actually living in the end times already? Yeah. Sometimes I wonder if, if Jesus already came and raptured all the good people and we're what's left. If we're lucky. Oh. But I haven't seen any piles of clothes on the benches. So. Oh, well, I mean, it depends on where you look. So maybe that got dark real fast here. <laughs> yeah. We are 11 minutes in and we're talking yeah. about the end days. Yeah. Okay. Well, That's this good. seems like a good enough uh, time to introduce our, our guest for this evening. The Rupocalypse. Oh, I already named this episode. I wonder if I can change it. Don't let me forget that. <laughs> Perfect. Rupocalypse. Oh, in the dark times of the Ru seasons. <laughs> um okay welcome welcome thank you for joining us um you know what let's hit the theme song instead we'll do introductions after Welcome back. This is Dork Matters. Uh, I'm your dad, Dork host, Ben Rankle. With me, as always, is... Lexi, your cover girl, Hunt. What? what? I'm so excited. Oh, wow. There you go. You killed yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. And we have a special guest. Uh, a special guest judge, perhaps, given the topic that we are doing this time. Um, it's not Michelle Visage. It's not Jordan Lane. But it's somebody I would say better than either uh, with us. Wow. I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, I am Kay. I am beautiful, hilarious, 
talented, and humble. I love it. And that's a callback. <laughs> you are our share. Or our RuPaul, I suppose. Just one letter. All it takes. Do you, whenever you see your name, do you think of that like uh, K jewelry ad that always played on the radio? Yeah. Every, Every kiss begins, begins with, with K. K. I'm going to now. Thank you, Dad Dork. In your courting life, has that been a thing that some suitor has brought toward you? Oh, gosh, no. No, um, I meet most people online these days, and no one can pronounce my name when they read it. So, Do you just get Kai all the time? Every time. Well, we aren't going to do that. You are Kay, and we are very glad to have you uh, with us to discuss. Yay! <laughs> We're in strange territory here this time in that uh, you are both uh, experts on RuPaul's Jerry Grace, and I have seen two and a half episodes, uh, which I crammed this week uh, so that I could try to keep up and have some some thoughts. So I'm going to have to take on the, uh, the role of the, uh, the everyman, the inquisitor, the unknowledgeable new person to the scene. Um, that's okay. That's okay. I'm so excited. Let's get some yep. bona fides, though. Uh, what makes you an expert on drag race, Kay? Wow. I mean, uh, I'm queer, and and that makes us all, you know, experts mm -hmm. on drag race. Uh, it gives me yep. opinions. It makes my drag opinions valid, just, you know, yeah. as drag is valid, as are all my opinions. You know, this is perfect, because this makes sense why I don't have any opinions on this particular subject matter, then. I could tell how straight you were when you called it RuPaul's today, <laughs> because... RuPaul's, did I pronounce it wrong? No, but the fans call it Drag Race, and the people oh. who are aware of it call it RuPaul, and it was so cool to see <laughs> in the wild which side you aligned yourself with. Uh, I align with the part that I know and understand and have cultural currency on, which was which is RuPaul. And that's what I felt coming into this show. Um, I have watched every season from the original i have watched every season of all stars i have watched two seasons of uk and i watched uk versus the world which let's not even go there um i have introduced people <laughs> i'm just finding out that there are versions other than the original i mean at this point so many there's canada's drag race which you notice i didn't say i watched um, not, not because the Queens aren't amazing. It's just oh. Canadian versions of TV shows can be really tough. Sometimes the lighting is always worse than the American version. So, uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I listen to two podcasts every week about drag race so that I can get the recaps and the tea. Oh. Uh, and I will talk to anyone who will listen about my drag race opinion. Well, we're here. We did it. Uh, wow, Lexi, do you watch the Canada one? Yeah, I. But like I said, after um, uh, Stephanie Prince was uh, kicked off the show, I thought, what's the point? Like, I was so frustrated. And that's off the Canadian one. Yeah. So Stephanie um, Stephanie Prince is uh, a Calgarian drag queen, and I was super super excited to see her on the show because. She's representing sure. the prairies. They don't have anyone from Manitoba or Saskatchewan. And I thought that was a travesty. But then there's like 9 million um, drag queens from like Toronto, Vancouver and like Montreal. But like there's other provinces, people. <laughs> yeah. But also yeah. um, what I love about Stephanie Prince is representing the Filipino community. And we have such a strong Filipino listenerhood of Dork Matters. And so awesome. we're, we're proud of... Stephanie Prince for kicking butt out there. We we're always uh, ranking in the the top ten for Philip uh, for Philippines yeah. uh, Apple Apple charts. Yeah, thank you, Philippines. That's amazing. We haven't quite figured it out yet, but that's that's a thing that happens, and we are absolutely thankful and grateful for those listeners. Super super thankful. Don't don't leave us. I've watched um, up to season twelve. I was telling uh, Ben earlier that I've taken taken a little time off because. I just needed some time away, but same, same. I've watched up to season 12, um, both seasons of uh, UK, also Down Under, and then like YouTube, um, some of the other 
um, other countries like Holland, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I'm, I'm a huge social media follower of many drag queens. Awesome. And I love like the Twitter versus Instagram drag queens. Yes. <laughs> and I also um, was listening to like, what's the tea and, um, oh, I have another drag queen for my list. My list keeps growing longer of drag queens that I love. Um, I follow a number of drag queens in Calgary, the local scene, because I like to yeah. follow people that are doing sort of creative uh, work in Calgary. And I realized I was very underrepresented on like the drag community as far as just seeing what they're up to and what they're doing. So I followed oh, like yeah. the Enough Family or whatever they call that. The House of Enough. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the House of Nuff and then Tangerine Dream yeah. and a few others. Felicia Bone. Uh, Indigo is great. Yes, Felicia is amazing. Um, the De Very Bad, uh, who's a drag king. Ooh. Uh, I actually saw Felicia Bone live at one point. I was with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw it together. Yeah, we saw um, Felicia together. Um, De, the De Very Best, who recently has moved from Calgary, um, but amazing drag king as well. Um, mm. that's one thing about Drag Race. I started following the girls and, you know, the queens, the contestants, and they're so great about encouraging the fans to yeah. follow local drag. I think some of the best fans and the best contestants have really, like, they, they come to the local bars, you see them, and they're usually supported by local talent, and they really encourage that, like, passion from the Drag Race fans yeah. to love your local scene, too, and support it however you yeah. can. I've been to a few shows in Calgary and like uh, I did Twisted once and then there used to be one upstairs uh, in Inglewood. What was that place called? I don't know that one. Um, it was above the Mexican restaurant, oh, Salt yeah. and Pepper, that used to be in Inglewood. That's awesome. And there was a bar upstairs. It was, I can't remember the name of it, but it's also there. Um, yeah, Twisted, I guess the Twisted shows are generally considered to be yeah. well, yeah. well known, well yeah. regarded. Um, I'm not sure if they're still doing them right now. It sounded like there's some some hubbub with some problems there's some other ways to enjoy drag in our community yes. like drag brunch yes. is a lovely way yeah. and my favorite is the higher in heels and so my friend did that for his wife on her birthday oh, cool. and so it's um it it was kind of like for for folks that aren't familiar and we'll we'll put it in the show notes too so you can see it's kind of like drag on demand and so you know, like skip the dishes in Canada, or if you're, um, what's, what's an international version of skip the dishes? Like mm, DoorDash. Yeah. DoorDash. You would Uber call Eats. Uber. Yeah. All very exploitative. We're not endorsing them. You would Uber yourself a drag queen. Amazing. <laughs> but you would, you would set it up and they come to your house and put on a drag show outside because of COVID. And so <laughs> my friend did that. So Uber brings you a drag queen. Well, they, they take themselves, but come with like their own speakers and they set up a drag show outside and uh yeah so my friend that did it for his uh for his partner he said the entire community yes. like people were coming out of their houses and it turned into like a block Absolutely. party outside and it's just like that it's amazing. amazing it's so cool we're gonna try to start an impromptu bro uh, block party in our neighborhood today <laughs> uh kay and i actually live in the same neighborhood in our city so. we've got to block off your very central block i would love to turn that into a party zone people would hate it that's queer <laughs> You have to get enough signatures from the people on the block. I think it's like like 80% of the people on your block have to sign and agree to allow the street closure. So weather's good. We're going to make um, friends. <laughs> let's get us back onto the roof hall. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm just going to go find some, buy some cheap uh, parking, like obstruction things. What are those called? Jesus, barriers? Pylons? Yeah, it's going to like the cone. I'll get some on Amazon. I'll, I'll next day them. I'm also not endorsing Amazon, unless it's a union Amazon <laughs> that one the ones that bezos doesn't care for. but we don't judge amazon queens because you've got to start somewhere no absolutely not yeah. you got to work somewhere gotta everyone's got to work somewhere you got you gotta make money that's the system we are trapped in that's actually one of the coolest things about drag race though the most recent season of drag race 13. had five trans contestants Whoa. by the time they got to the end of the I season yeah um Two people who had come out, um, one who has been out for years, one who came out prior yeah. to uh, the airing, but before filming, someone who came out on the show. And one person said that something that had held them back for like eight to 10 years was they are a food service worker as well as a drag queen, and they knew they could not afford to transition, and they knew it would be difficult to work without money and to become a Rue girl 
opens up your world in a way financially that it gives you the chance to claim your gender. I mean, how cool is that? That is very cool. Um, and it also, uh, it brings up a topic that I'd wanted to chat about a little bit, which is just, I, I, tried to hit as much of like the talking points that I could find online about the show. One of them was, uh, was sort of an issue with gender and identity being represented on the show. Yep. Um, it sounds like that was an earlier, an earlier season. Is that a RuPaul thing or is that a show thing or is it both? The show had some issues. I would say in the first couple seasons about making mm-hmm. some like fat phobic type comments, yep. um, like dragging some people under, in a really toxic way even yeah. like some of the treatments of like the fandom and I and there were some problematic comments about who can do drag and I think over time it's evolved whether or not it's for altruistic means who knows probably not but I think it's really kind of opened up from the outsider's perspective it's it, it appears to have been become more inclusive over over the seasons I think if anything Rue has noticed that the world is changing. Um, and Rue is, yeah. I mean, a person in his, her sixties, Rue is said they're cool with any pronoun. So I'll, I'll probably use them interchangeably. Um, but yeah, I mean, Rue is somebody who is, is in their sixties, uh, comes from a different vision of sexuality, gender, queerness, mm-hmm. what female presentation is. I mean, I think at one point they said that they would, or he would not want a contestant who had had a breast job so surgery but i mean now i mean especially when the girls show up for all stars everybody's got fillers so like where are you going to judge the plastic Mm -hmm. surgery um there have been now trans contestants uh there's even somebody who had previously transitioned and then de-transitioned if that's the word i think that they use um so i think rue has had to catch up with the world and rue loves emmys so (laughs) you got to be on the right side of history (laughs) I guess whatever the motivation is. Well, and Rue's not afraid of controversy. Not at all. Like the, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with some of the the controversy around some of the contestants that were on um, Down Under Drag Race. And no. There were two in particular. Um, there was one individual who, like, I don't know the whole drama in, in, in spades, but basically had made some very racist and not great comments in the past and wasn't, was kind of benefiting from them and it was not great. And then another queen similar had a very like offensive tattoo, but since had it removed and was trying to do through, go through the work. And um, anyway, lots of people were saying those queens shouldn't be on the show. They shouldn't have this platform. And Rue kind of made a stand of saying, if a person makes a mistake and learns from it, do they not earn themselves another chance? And it's, is it better to just say like, no, you're canceled period. Or do we not give them a platform to learn from the community make changes and be a better person and then highlight that journey. And so I think the feedback around one of the Queens was like, well, she ain't doing that, but it's, it's hard. I don't know your life, right? Like, I don't know what they're doing, but I thought that was a really interesting approach because the community was like, get those Queens out of there. But Rue was like, Nope. Well, this is a topic I feel like I can speak on as a, uh, you know, cis hat white male. Like (laughs) if I'm not allowed to improve my history, (laughs) my history, will never allow me to do anything else. Um, you know, like I've, I've chatted, I think with both of you about this before, but like society has been built to make me a certain thing and it's mm-hmm. not a thing I want Us to be. Too. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I am, I am designed to fill, uh, the role of oppressor and, and take that mantle on and carry it forward. <laughs> and like, I didn't realize that for a very long time. Yeah. And it was just a series of people dressing me down and, and telling me you got your head fucking wrong. Uh, and, and yeah, like, you know, there's definitely people that have done worse or, or better, but like, if I just did not have an, an opportunity to improve, um, it would just be so disappointing to me individually. Now I'm not saying that everyone deserves to have a platform after like to do that improvement work or, or, or deserves to continue to be out there. I'm just, I guess grateful and personally uh, can appreciate the need to to improve because there's just so many fucked up people out there. Mm-hmm. We, we got to make some room for them, or else it's it's not going to get any better. I think. Absolutely, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, I'm not a supporter or a believer in cancel culture, and I think yeah, there's a difference between I'm not going to feature you on my TV show or I'm going to comment on the fact that you're on my TV show. I mean, there was 
someone who was noted or found to be a, a sexually predatory person. Um, and that news mm -hmm. came out, I think like three to five days before a season aired in which that person yeah. was in every single episode because they had been so successful on the show. Oh, like final four. Yeah. They, they did wow. make it to the final four. Yep. Um, and it came out literally days beforehand that there were, credible accounts of, of abuse from this person and how they handled it at that point was uh you know a, a statement on the beginning of every episode and then a donation to i believe it was to rain um yeah. the race rape and incest network in the states that is that is such an interesting just sort of bringing up that idea of the caveat or whatever the warning ahead of time because that's sort of where we're at now we have all this media <laughs> beloved media beloved people and things from the past and it's like do we we talked about this a little bit earlier, Kay, just in regards to the Nutcracker being put on yes. in our city, and they've uh, they've pulled out a couple scenes that were considered culturally insensitive. And it's like, do you leave that in, or do you take it out, or do you leave it in and put the caveat ahead of it and say, this stuff, when it was made, they thought this was an appropriate way to display this. We now know that it was wrong then, it's wrong now, but we're going to leave it in so you can see what was there. I mean, sometimes I think that's worthwhile. Other times I think if it's actively harmful, it's good to could pop that shit out but like yeah it's a case by case thing i think you don't get to have a a standard that you can just apply across the board because life yeah. isn't like that it's so hard and we, i was having a similar conversation with some folks today about uh appropriation versus appreciation and especially in the arts community so much of art historically came from appropriation yes. and a lot of people would say that you can't have our current level of art without some form of it and so we were just having the conversation about, well, that's, that may be true, but we, we know better. So let's do better. And yes. if you are profiting in some, in some capacity, financially, fame, whatever, then it moves past that appreciation. If I really love um, a particular artist who happens to be an individual of color or from a marginalized group, and I'm just, you know, I'm recreating it and drawing it because I love it. And that's for me. And I'm learning about the style and that's to me, that's like an educational thing versus I'm going to stamp my name on it and then put it out yeah. there and then like reap the benefits of it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You open up your society six shop exactly. and start putting it on yeah. mugs and t-shirts and everybody can have a canvas tote bag. Especially when there's a financial component. Exactly. Yeah. And especially if we're looking at communities that have literally been criminalized for practicing art, culture, spirituality. Yeah. yeah. For us to slap a price tag on it and say, I've been profiting on this for centuries, but also I'm going to continue. Very different than, like you say, an appreciation, an education. Yeah. But, and coming back to drag too, I know that there's um, there was one episode a couple seasons ago um, where a lot, if there's always an episode where the Queen's, make over people and sometimes it's like their moms or sometimes it's like the crew and then this happened to be like drag race super fans yes. and they were all like straight women and people like the the community seemed split over that like people were like cool and other people were like what the hell and it was yes like but like you say it's um RuPaul is like uh, like drag race has been so much about pulling people into the community and building out that sense of network and kinship. And I thought yes. that um, I think it was Jada Essence Hall who kind of made a statement about like um, the the straight women in their life. And I do apologize. I'll have to double check that this is an accurate thing, but we're have always been so welcoming and supportive of drag. And so it's okay to enjoy drag and it isn't for yes. any one specific person. Sometimes if you're, into drag and you're positive and you're uplifting in the community welcome and so when I was going through a really difficult time in my life there were some some difficulties drag race was there for me like it was a positive lovely source and I would watch Damn. like at, like and I was saying a bit like I'll like binge four episodes and cry and like yes like, it's just it's amazing right it's cathartic oh and they take you there I mean the podcasts I love, love to point out the edit of whether it's a winner's edit or the we're going to, you know, a lot of the girls will joke. Drag Race is putting on an outfit, crying about your dead mom, telling someone some trauma from yesterday and from today and trying to be catty. You know, it's, it's, it's a race. Yeah. Um, and, 
and I cry absolutely at those mirror chats. But I remember the first time sitting, becoming aware of, oh my gosh, there are five black people who are queer on my screen talking about their life. And like, nobody has made this a weird issue. And I don't feel like I'm looking in, in a way that's worse than any other person who's watching this show. We've all been invited in to this minor exploitation at the mirror chat. Um, that is also just speaking. I mean, people have spoken about conversion therapy, about good and bad relationships with their parents, uh, drug abuse, recovery. I mean, people really on that show have widened what the queer experience is, I think. And to have a straight cis audience appreciate that and see that and see queer people as more dimensional and multidimensional, who's going to argue with that? <laughs> I love it. I love drag. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's only one thing we can do now, which is grind this beautiful discussion we're having into uh, the dirt by playing our halftime game. Who's that Pokemon? It's time. Who's that Pokemon? Do, 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 do. Oh no. I'm so afraid. We're just having the most lovely conversation. I'm enjoying the hell out of it and like really getting some insight into this sort of idea of a platform for people that have no place else to go and express themselves to the world. And I'm just going to run us into the ground with who's that Pokemon. Thanks, white guy. All my Pokemon knowledge is from Pokemon Go. This game makes me so <laughs> nervous every time. Every time I listen, I'm just like, I'm not going to win. And I'm playing against myself. It's been like 30% uh, real Pokemon. Uh, I'm doing something wild and I'm choosing a real Pokemon. Oh, <sighs> okay, okay. What, what gen? What generation are we talking here? Uh, I think I'm going to go first gen just to keep things chill. <gasps> um, okay. And I've chosen a controversial Pokemon. That's your hint. Ooh. Is it Mr. Mime? It's not Mr. Mime. Is Mr. Mime controversial? Because yeah, he sucks. Such a creep. It's the drag queen Pokemon. Oh. <laughs> it's Jinx. We saw. Should I pick another one? You solved it immediately. Oh, listen again. Good job, Kay. Yeah, I mean that is that is it. We didn't even get to the silhouette. Our our guest has just knocked it out of the park in two seconds. <laughs> Do, 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 do. It's Jinx. Uh, Jinx has a lot of controversy around Jinx. Um, there is uh, the the criticism of, of, of uh, sort of minstrelness and, and blackface around Jinx. Um, the color of the Pokemon was changed from being oh, black okay. to purple in, in later iterations of it to try to get around that. Um, the claim was that the what I remember reading was that the idea was that Jinx is supposed to be a ghost, not black, which is why they have that hollow okay. missing appearance in the earlier versions of it. But So they're wearing a cloak. I guess so. It's hard to say. Uh, honestly, I just find Jinx so strange that I don't really see them as much as anything, but I can appreciate where some people are coming from on this one. Yeah, a controversial uh, uh, Pokemon here for an episode dealing with a lot of interesting topics like that. That's great. Uh, this is our shortest who's that Pokemon ever. <laughs> I, I almost feel like I, I should give you all another one. Sure, yeah, a twofer. Yeah. You want to do a double? Two for one. Okay, we're doing a twofer. I believe in us. They knocked that out of the park way too quickly, so we're doing another <laughs> here. Um, we're going to keep it We're going to keep it Gen 1. Uh, what we have is sort of a long, almost tongue-like shape. Uh, and then at the bottom, um, there's sort of two round balls at the bottom of this sort of engorged tongue-like shape. And then two round balls at the bottom. Uh, Are you sure that's not just a dick pic? <laughs> you'd be surprised by the number of Pokemon that actually could be a dick in silhouette. Uh, <laughs> it has to be Most intentional. Fair, this is not yeah. our first. Yeah, uh, I'll try to give a little more. Uh, it's got a little bit maybe of like a little a little drippy hang thing off the top of the engorged tongue portion. And then uh, you could see like maybe some slight, almost veiny bumps coming off the side. Okay. I'm now just trying to make it sound like a dick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is actually still an accurate uh, silhouette though. I didn't have to describe the protrusions <laughs> off the side as veiny, but I stand by it. Are you? 
I was just, is it lick a tongue? Side tangent. It's not lick a tongue. Let's do our tangent and we'll come back. Okay. Well, I just think that Pokemon would be such a great theme for a drag race runway. I would, I would love to see that. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. What well, more? Rock'em. Yeah. Sakura was kind of like, had, has a couple like, uh, anime yes. style, it's more, it's more like, Pokemon meets Gundam yeah. meets like Sailor Moon. So I feel like if Rock'em... Okay, I need to know what episodes I need to look at for this because it sounds up my alley. So it's Rock'em Sakura, who is one of the best drag queens ever. Love her. Amazing. Um, just has a really like incredible aesthetic it's very it's very dork matters um i know that you work from home ben oh. but be careful where you google yeah. rockham sakura's name because they do also have a very famous photo of them having public sex at the Folsom street fair because they're true queer excellence i mean i'm trying to find that i don't want to not find that <laughs> exactly why would I not want to find that? That sounds great. But Rock does amazing drag. You should check out their Instagram as well. For I absolutely will. Drag race right. stuff. It's incredible. I'm going to do one yeah. final yeah. finger. Oh, that sounds wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna, <laughs> listeners at home, I am doing the outline of this uh, this shape with my finger. Uh, here we go. I, 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 I don't know. I cannot think of it. <laughs> and yes, it is just outlining a dick yet again. Uh, it's, uh, is it secured upside down? No, it's not upside down. This is, this is right side up. All right. I gotta know. Uh, let me know if you want to throw in the I, towel. I gotta know what, it, who, who, what is it? I give up. I give up. It's Wabafet. Oh, Wabafet. Yeah. There we go. Wabafet. Yeah. Wabafet. Who indeed does look. You're right. Like a penis. That was, that was a good description. Very dickish. Uh, it's Wabafet. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's everyone's favorite part of Dork Matters. <laughs> Wab effect. We're back. Um, so should I just start list- listing off my favorite drag queens or absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please do. I wanted to just say one thing that I noticed immediately on the very first episode was just what a performer Rue is. Um yes. the positioning, the movements, everything oh, is calculated yes. and thought about, but does not come across as robotic. And just like the head turns, the enunciation, the projection, it was it was exceptional. I was so impressed with just like how poised Rue is as a performer. It was uh, it caught me right away. The other thing that caught me was that uh, that yep. first episode I watched, everything is just smeared with grease every single time. <laughs> yes, and that becomes like a running joke later on. Yes. Oh, yeah. does. I was like, oh, this is very, very strange. Well, and this is something... I have not seen this much grease on the camera since, like, Barbara Walters on 60 yeah. Months. Like, Well, and thankfully, something they stopped doing about five or six seasons in is taking the girls outside into natural light because how a drag queen is lit is very important, too. I mean, I believe it's it's from above and straight on. I don't know how it is, but if it were my job to know, I promise I would do it, right? Yeah, yeah. By season six, there was no more Vaseline. I jumped around <laughs> a bit to watch episodes, and uh, yeah, that was gone. Yeah. What I did notice in season six was suddenly everybody was much more, like, the first episode that I watched, the very first one, it's very sincere, and everyone is just sort of like, just doing their thing. And then by episode six, uh, or season six, I mean, I noticed that everyone is much more aware of cameras and it feels a little bit more like people are being queued up to give like sort of confessional speeches and stuff or that sort of thing. It's a little more produced. Absolutely. And at this point you have um, contestants on the show who have literally grown up with drag race. And so they understand like the ebb and flow and like, what makes for a successful queen to the point that there have been some very notable queens who go on and are like, I've cracked the formula and I'm going to do this. That, yes. and, everything. and then they get their asses just handed to them because you think you've cracked it. No, you haven't. And it's so it's, it's wild to watch how like these people who are like, I started watching the show when I was eight. And then they're like these adults and you're sitting there thinking, Oh my goodness, this is literally a part of society now. And it's awesome. Yes. Love it. Well, and something I mentioned to you, Ben, is that uh, 
the show starts almost as a parody of America's Next Top Model um, and uh, other shows like that. Uh, the design one with Tim Gunn. Project Runway. Yes, Project Runway. Um, and even Survivor is something that the people, that like contestants will reference mm-hmm. later on. And so there is a thing initially where they put the queens into ridiculous situations because that's what Tyra does to models. And later it becomes, we put Queens into ridiculous Mm. situations because that's great TV. And it really fucks with someone's confidence sometimes. Mm. And the producers become so good at pulling out a talking head and the story producers really earn their money on that show every season. Oh yeah. 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 It's fascinating just to see how it, it progresses in the like jumping around episodes that I've watched. Yeah. And to see, I mean, the quality of what the people, what the contestants bring. I mean, that that first episode, somebody walks in in jeans. And now your entrance look is considered, I mean, some people spend thousands of dollars on them, what? which is wild. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yes. It's, it's yeah. a huge deal. Uh, if I can share one more thing that, like, jumped out at me. Um, in one of the episodes I was watching, um, I'm going to paraphrase a bit, but one of the queens says, they're talking about how like so-and-so is super good at dancing, but they just taught themselves by learning martial arts at home and doing some other stuff. And then like that led to them learning how to dance at home on their own. And they're sort of sharing stories of that, like how they taught themselves to do X. And one Mm -hmm. of the Queens goes, we teach ourselves the things we want to know because we were too scared growing up to go learn in group settings. And that was like, yes. Oh Jesus. Like it's just something that you take for granted. Um, And it was just so interesting and poignant the ability to become these amazing performers, but like having to do it self-taught and it becomes a thing unto itself. And it's like, I feel like I may be starting to understand the drag scene a bit more with a, with a comment like that. And that like why that performance ends up being what it is and how it becomes such an important cultural point for so many people. I thought that was really cool. Really interesting. If we can talk favorite quotes, Um, it's a fairly recent one from Monique Hart just talking about like growing up as like um you know a person of color who's queer who's into drag but really really connected to the church yes and that kind of that 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 really that tug between different worlds and how difficult that is and i was just like i can't come out like i'm not trying to go to hell and he was like look i've been a gay man my whole life and he goes i know that god loves me and it was just in that place of constantly being affirmed by different ones that like if he is who he says he is, then he has to love you no, no matter what. We, you just have to go to him as you are. Which took me back to Bible school, Hebrews 4. Boldly come before the throne of grace, boldly asking for new mercy. So I said, well, I got to go accepting and loving all of this, not hiding it. Mo is so great. All right? Like, just so good. So many, so many amazing lines, but um, just talking about, like, you are good enough. Yes. And it's such, it's one thing, like, I don't want to, it's, you have to listen um, to the actual audio because it is like you get caught in your throat because it is so powerful and that's what so many like the show is goofy yes. the show is absolute camp <laughs> it's bananas that's the point but then you get these like super real emotional moments where people are like I am good enough and you're like yes. damn right yeah. you're good enough and I wanted to see what, like, I wanted to try to, in my very limited viewing, get a sense of what it is, this thing that sort of transcended and became, like, iconic in pop culture and what that was. And it has to be the heart of these so huge. people that do not get to be seen mm-hmm. and they're being seen and saying the things that they need to say for the first time. And that's got to be it, right? It's a perspective from a place that is underrepresented. And I think that has to be at least part of that sauce, that secret sauce. There's the power, too, of, like, an entertainer. So they know, you know, at least when you audition for Drag Race, you believe you're good enough to at least send in your tape. Uh, And so to think that, like, these are people who outwardly are bombastic, creative, visual artists, makeup artists, performers, and then they also to get that internal life is to me so much more interesting than the way the show loves to do its talking heads with everyone in boy drag and then show everyone on the stage in, in drag drag. Um, Cause I think the duality of people or, or like just the layers of them is in the revelations that people have in this teeny tiny little mm. pressure chamber. That is a reality TV show competition too. 
the comment that you made. Someone made a similar comment this season about uh, teaching themselves a skill out of fear uh, and not feeling safe to to be honest and to to teach themselves in a, a safe situation in sport. But they, yeah, there's just the power of wow. How many of us recognize that? And, and yeah, feel empowered by it. And, you know, the fact that it is a lot of the time something you can watch with kids, depending on what the, the lyrics are and how well your kid could read closed captionings. Yeah, it's weird how much I don't care about swearing. But then suddenly when my children are around, I'm like, I feel like you got to learn this word later on on your own. <laughs> I feel like I can't just hand you this. Um, you have to you have to earn the power of an F-bomb. You can't. You can't just grab it because dad did. The worst thing uh, one of our, our children has said up to this point is, uh, I was talking with Kay about this a little bit today. Uh, they called uh, a relative a silly pig. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like racking our brains trying to figure out, okay, so you took two individual things. You know silly, you know pig. You've never heard anyone call someone a silly pig because we just don't. But that is what you've come up with. And you weren't even trying to be mean by saying silly pig, um, but in a criticism of a way somebody was playing at the playground, a relative of, of ours, uh, the, the, the name silly pig was thrown out there. And it felt just as offensive as like dropping some sort of <laughs> pejorative term on, on somebody when they're just not doing what you want them to do. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and, you know, as I said earlier, that wow. kid is going to learn to read you yeah i we cannot discount the possibility that said relative was in fact being a silly wow. pig we don't we can't we brutal. cannot discount that we cannot take that truth away from our child um <laughs> but yes they do need to earn the f-bomb themselves i'd rather them not uh, get that necessarily from me so you, Lexi, you have to tell me some of your favorite queens and then we can just gush <laughs> yeah i want i want top five queens from both of you is that okay or is that too limited oh, no uh, it's too oh limiting. It's far too oh. limiting, Ben. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, let's try to do it like this then. Let's shot for shot. We we are nearing oh the God. end of what we'd call our show. Oh. Somehow, we just blow through an hour when we get really excited about what we're <laughs> chatting about. And I think uh, Drag Race managed to be one of those topics. I, I just want to start by saying, even though like um, I have one all-time favorite and then everybody else is just like here <laughs> and even if i don't say their name it's not that i don't love them it's like you love your pets yeah. and your children in different ways they're all i wouldn't so, refer to them as pets like, but yes <laughs> i don't have children <laughs> i can't tell you if i love my cat or my dog more it's just different so it's <laughs> i love so many dry queens but for so many different reasons yes. but my my ride or die my all-time like would fly across the country is jujube i love jujube what about me <gasps> what about jujube jujube is amazing yeah okay i wanted some rebuttal thoughts just in case you disagree i mean so the only thing I could say about Juju B that would be approaching bad, bad is that some of their runways on UK versus the world were not amazing. I will agree. But there was no flipping prize money. And if you don't provide prize money, you can't expect people to spend tens of thousands of dollars yeah. for your show. That's not yeah. how it works. So, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, compared to how Mo looked on every runway of UK versus the world. Uh, I know. But Juju B was just playing the game right. And no one's ever going to stop loving Juju B. I, I can't fight no. that at all. No way. Uh, so why did UK versus the world not have prize money? Because I saw in the first season, it's 10000 By season six, it's uh, up to 100000 in prize money. American. That's in America. Yes. So the UK show, no, because it airs on the oh. BBC. So similar to if it were on CBC, except I think CBC has better rules around this. But yeah, BBC, you cannot offer prize money. So that's why the Great British Baking Show is so genial, is yeah. they're not fighting over money. <laughs> they're just fighting over hanging out with... I mean, I would fight to hang out with Noel Fielding. Oh, but, yes, of course. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Darren Paul, Hollywood's icy eyes. <laughs> Yes. Shake my hand, Paul. Whoa. Shake it. Hey, settle down. Are... <laughs> That's what he does, babe. You need to watch uh, Bake Off. 
His name is Paul Hollywood. What do you think? I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. And that's saying no. something since I came into <laughs> this episode, episode watching 2.5 episodes yeah. of RuPaul's Drag Race. Or as I like to call it, RuPaul's. RuPaul. RuPaul's. RuPaul's. The RuPaul's. I will RuPaul's. absolutely do a, 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 a great, great bake, British bake. Br- fuck me. What? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sounds like you looked into Paul Hollywood's eyes. Holy shit, that is the worst I've ever worked to say something before and had it fail. Okay, that's okay. I didn't even get there in the we end. We knew what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Yeah, the great... <laughs> uh, yeah. Ah, yes, the great... <sighs> the great... <laughs> Where they make cakes. Among other things. Anyway, okay, next, next. What do you got, Kay? I feel like, and this is probably because I started watching with season eight... Bob the Drag Queen is to me just like yes. such a superstar. Love the name. Hi, I'm Bob the Drag Queen, a queen for the people. And as a public servant, I believe in serving the people. That's why I want BJs for every single American. That's right, better jobs for every American. Yeah, um, that's where I got my intro from. The beautiful, hilarious, talented, and humble. Uh, Bob the Drag Queen is just, wow. I mean, they've got heart. They are in a throuple, yeah. which is funny because they beefs with Derek Barry on their season. And actually, it's not a throuple, but they they, ha- they do polyamory, and I love it. And they do black women drag that is so fun and so awesome. And Bob, I love you, Bob. I think you're great. <laughs> Bob is fast, witty, like well-spoken, can command a room like completely without anybody else, but, um, and also yes. political. And I love like a smart, witty, so, political yes. person. And so Bob is so good about that. Yes. And then I'm going to, I'm going to add on to that. I'm going to jump in there and say what I love about Bob is also um, Monet Exchange that little the dynamic yes. between Bob and so many other drag queens but Monet Sibling rivalry yeah so good I love Monet so this is actually something I wanted to ask you all about because I noticed a little bit of like I don't know if it's just for show or something but like people were getting a little bit like rough with each other and like sort of mean um <laughs> which is just drag talk in big ways is that just drag talk is there a lot of camaraderie like what is the bigger vibe from this is it like the I'm not even trying to put it on drag queens. I'm putting it on reality TV, the way reality TV tries to pit the characters, if you will, against each other. And is it more that or is there a camaraderie? Is it somewhere in the middle? I think a great, it's somewhere in the middle. It depends on the Mm -hmm. season, but a great example of that is Bianca Del Rio. I remember Bianca. Bianca's in that episode from season six. I saw Bianca was an amazing comedian. In an anime, like another one of my, my listies here, but would like shit all over people and say like snarky things. And then someone would be like, Oh, I need help. And Bianca would be the first one over there. Exactly. Yeah. It was encapsulated in that episode where somebody takes a moment, like in one of those like confessional aside sort of things, and is like, I'm having a little bit of trouble with so and so because like they'll just say some shit to me, and then also they're absolutely delightful and helpful and never like try to stop me from oh. getting what I'm trying to get done. Like a mother daughter. Adore and Bianca together is such a beautiful relationship because in that same episode, Bianca says, the "Majority of these younger queens have this idea that it's all about sisterhood and being friendly. Fuck these bitches. I'm in a drag competition. Every clown for their fucking selves. You're like evil nice. Like what's with that? It's like you can't hate you because you're helpful and you're sweet, but you're truthful, but you're a dick. Now if you'd have said this on day one, I'd have been your friend. It's amazing." get this close and you're leaving today yeah i mean adore growing up from like 12 years old to 12 and a half in that season is so fun to watch um but yeah no i mean there is a cattiness there's also um in the all-star spinoff where contestants return there's now a voting component oh, where you vote off other yeah. and this has led to death threats for the last six 
so sorry, three seasons that it's happened since All Stars four. Contestants to each other? No, from fans. Oh, so oh, people oh. have been of really course. badly yeah. harassed on social media. It almost always has a racial component. So queens of color oh get it a lot worse. Um, also, queens of color have historically had fewer followers and have had less support on social media. So had harder times getting verified. Um, have struggled to just like monetize themselves in the same way because people are racist Mm -hmm. and so therefore the fan base is racist in its own systematic gross ways well and like and fat phobic too because there were some like from the uk like season two so the winner of season two who i loved um lawrence cheney was a bigger uh, queen great performer and people were kind of freaking out because other people like bimini and taste were were booking all these like really really big shows and performances and da 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 and people were like what about lawrence and lawrence actually stepped in and was like i'm fine stop speaking for me and that's yeah. what has been so great about social media and like the interaction is the queens will go out and be like stop doing this and and in, in to the point where, like, if they don't, it gets called out on the show of, like... Yes. It, 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 it's so fascinating sometimes because you hear that dynamic. You didn't protect me. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's wild. It's wild. I mean, the trailer for the latest All-Star season, which is an all-winner season, yeah. which, like... So exciting. So exciting. Yeah. In the trailer, two queens have been shown talking in, in one of the untucked or the quiet couch moments, saying, oh, I thought we were over this. And it's, I believe one of the uh, predominantly most loved black queens in the history of the franchise is speaking to somebody who has a history of, I have not seen the comments, so I'm just going to say problematic is how they've been interpreted. I'm not defending this person. I just haven't seen them, but it's a white queen who said some shit and has maybe going to get called out on the cameras for it. And honestly, they'll probably, everyone will probably be able to spin that in an okay way because I think those people also recognize their images so much that the conversations on camera are not usually the first time it's talked about. <laughs> um, I, I mean, everyone's right. producing themselves now. I think, especially when you get to an all-star oh. season. They're having side conversations, yeah. like going, like, do you want to talk about this on screen? Like, can we That's can why we you've got to listen to the podcast, screen? is so that people yeah. call in and say, oh, yeah, she mentioned on the bus she was going to bring this up when we were getting ready. I always want to know when it's fake. This is our new thing. We Every episode, we try to divert listeners to other podcasts now. Um, Kay was telling me that our, our pre- one of our previous episodes with uh, Ryan Estrada had uh, them jumping out to go oh, listen yes. to the Lolita podcast that I'm Jess, loving it. Jess was plugging, which brought up a very fascinating conversation today over lunch with uh, yourself, myself, and, oh, and, and no. my wife. <laughs> yeah, Borat, everybody. Oh. Cultural reference. Only lesbians are allowed <laughs> to say that. Uh, but just discussing Lolita as... Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got to get into that. We might have to do a revisit to Lolita. We might have to actually read the book and, and check out the I've media. I've got my copy right here because I was looking at the cover as compared and discussed on the podcast. It was interesting. It brought up some discussion and Fiona's like, I like that book and here's why and had some great salient points that I had not, I have no experience with this title except for like we sort of touched on very briefly the cultural sort of capital that it currently has and the space it takes up in the mind of people that have not experienced the media itself. It was very interesting, very Mm -hmm. wild conversation. Just being like, yeah, it is an unreliable narrator. It's a, he's a terrible person and you're meant to understand that throughout the book and experience the disgusting approach that this person takes to, to predatory uh, behavior, but also creating an illusion for themselves where they get to feel like a hero. It's, it needs to be those things. So it was, it was fascinating. We've got to revisit that at some point, I think maybe and have a, or, or just go listen to uh, the Lolita podcast that Jess plugged in the <laughs> yeah. Ryan Estrada episode of our, of our show. <laughs> Shout out producer. All of that was to say, Kay bounced on our episode and, and, and rolled on over to <laughs> Lolita podcast. Yeah. I mean, I just, I love, I love the dish. Uh, one of the podcasts I listen to actually recaps uh, from the beginning. So they now have people talking about, you know, a show they were on eight, 10 years ago and remembering their experience. And then, you know, Oh yeah, fans still bring this up, but like, I'm so over it. It is. Um, I think it's really a show where you sort of get to remember 
how much you do not have a relationship with these people as much as you really want to, uh, because I just love them. Interesting. I feel like that's such a good thing. You need yes. to get knocked down as a fandom a bit. Like yeah. the parasocial relationship that we here on uh, Dork Matters <laughs> are actually striving for is not, is not necessarily healthy. We're looking for that sweet, sweet parasocial. We're your friends. Come, come have a chat with us. I think like they almost want to divert it. They're saying, like, go check out your local queens instead. I like the idea of that. Yes. Oh, it's interesting. And, like, we don't know each other. You don't know me. Don't speak for me. Go check out your queens. Support the community. Support what we're doing. But don't think you know me. And I love it. Yeah. It's brilliant. It's great. It's a, it's a healthy line for reality contestants. It's a line that needs to be drawn Agreed. with fandoms, totally. I think. Yeah. All right. We're going a little long. So I, I don't want either of you to be mad at me for taking away time to talk about favorite queens. Um, but Kay, you have not given us any yet. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do a couple here for okay. you. Okay. So, so Bob, definitely. And, and I'll just try and, to dodge angry yeah. looks from Lexi. <laughs> uh, Bob, excellent. Um, and yes, Monet Exchange, their, their sibling in, in competition. Oh, other queens. Uh, Sasha Velour from the next season. Um, I'm probably mm -hmm. going to go chronologically now. Um, Jada Essence Hall, previously mentioned. Okay. America, I'm your favorite bottom. No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Like, wow, what a performer. Uh, I think she's from Milwaukee and uh, has spoken on, like, the issues of race. Is also connected with other queens who won uh, Shea Coulee the best to ever live, oh, uh, I think. Amazing, yeah. My name is Shea kool and I didn't come to play. I came to play. You know what? Jackie Cox, I really like. We've had two people from Canada go on the show, so they must have, like, good work visas or something. Jackie Cox, I really loved. Um, she spoke to her Iranian heritage. Uh, she got into it with Jeff Goldblum while wearing um, a headscarf. When the Muslim ban happened... It really destroyed a lot of my faith in this country. And really hurt my family. And that's so wrong to me. Wow, what a cool That's an episode I want to see. Yeah, I'll send you I'll tell you which one you'll love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, a really cool yeah. performer that I think their Canadianness just made me that's feel good, like, yeah. oh, I relate to you a little. And gorgeous out of drag which we also love to look for um that's what so kind yeah. of what we're here for too I mean, so you would say a uh, a hottie who is good <laughs> um, a candidate for trade of the season is what we would say in the parlance <laughs> okay um i think we got to find something good to go out on here which is i want you both to just lay down some negativity on the worst queen on the show <sighs> Who is it? Who was it? Who is the one that was not good, was a problem, was, needed to go? And Okay, on the count of three, you can both say who you... Do you have somebody in mind? No, because... So there's a theory that, that was around for a while that uh, when they did a top three, that RuPaul loves a villain. She loves a showgirl, a wild card, and a villain, which means somebody got a villain edit every season... Regardless oh. of whether they were really a bad person, and mm -hmm. I've fallen for it so many times, but I. I mm. so what you're yeah. saying is no bad queens. I mean, like there's, there's the sexual predator. There's the person who threatened to bomb drag con. Some bad queens. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's some like yeah, like there's but even that like there's a there's one drag queen that I'm thinking of that I actually quite liked until I was reading all this like kind of predatory behavior on like rupaul's um like the the drag race crews oh. and not great um drug usage with like alaska and so but then at the same yes. time too it's like that's all that's a lot of conversation and you don't want to believe everything yeah. if you're on like reddit so sure. it's kind of like and i guess when i was asking i meant more like is there a queen that you think just didn't do it for you like just like i don't know didn't didn't fit in. Didn't work. I want a villain edit on the end of our ah, show. Okay, well, now I'm blanking on names. Okay, I, I mean, I think I could throw someone under. The I bus. have one. I have one. But even then, it's like it's a very loose one. Okay, let's hear it. Yeah, like, and I, but I, at the same time too. Okay, this is going to sound wild, but so mine is Aiden Zane. Okay, but I, 
I felt like I remember I was raking my leaves one day and I was talking to myself, but Rue decided that Aiden needed to be there. So there's got to, like, I was having that conversation with myself in my head, but like, you need to trust Rue because Rue sees something in Aiden. So, so, but, and that was, there were moments of greatness with Aiden, but I thought that like, it was, I, I just felt like Aiden wasn't ready yet. Needed to like have that experience, go away, learn from it, and then come back and we'll see like greatness. Bitch, at the end of the day, I am sitting here safe. Did at some point, did both of you do a costume change? I feel like neither of you were wearing the same things that you were when we started recording <laughs> this sorry. podcast. I'm wearing my decolonized MRU shirt. Oh, today. nice. Oh, I love that shirt. That's great. I've never seen that before. That's dope. Uh, yeah. Dr. Linda Many Guns gave it to me. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, okay. So am I just, I'm just, uh, you're just crazy. having some hallucinations <laughs> here. Oh, 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 you're going to make me pay money. Oh, oh, wow. You guys just caught me. Okay. Oh, damn. Okay. No, you're I'm just... only bringing it up because we talked about it today. <laughs> Is it better if I make it worse? Um, yeah. No, who's going to get canceled? <laughs> no, yeah. I'll, uh, we'll tally it up and then I'll make the donation. We are responsible for the people we bring on the show. In the spirit of Aiden Zane, um, who I think is somebody who was maybe brought in, uh, let's say, too soon in their career. Yeah. Um, Soju. Yes. Soju was not ready to be on Drag Race. Yeah. Soju, agreed. Ben, to give you context, is somebody who, <sighs> before they were cast on the show, did YouTube recaps of the show. So it was very... We've we've brought oh, we created her and now we bring her here. Yes. And so she cool. Wow, there's a really cool picture I just found of this person though. I, I bet that they're awesome yeah. now, but yeah. But that's like so do you need a time. One sewing oh, yeah. lesson. One sewing lesson. You don't sew your yes. first dress oh on God. drag race. Oh, you gotta know how to sew. I've watched two episodes and I know that. You get sewing lessons if nothing else. Sewing lessons and dance lessons. Come on, people. Like, and if you're not a comedy queen, you pay somebody 20 to $30 for some reads that are generic enough that you can just pu plug in anyone's name. Yes. Agreed. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Hire a comedian, get some jokes. See, we could coach people to go on drag race. I feel for success. A new spinoff <laughs> podcast, drag race coach. Oh my God. Uh, se Semi-generic <laughs> advice for any queen looking to go on the show. Oh, yeah, that's Soju's promo look. And she does yeah. look gorgeous. That was great colors. That time it's just too. such a cool photo. The colors are just oh, popping yeah. and the, the pose is great. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean. Yeah, whoever the photographer or like editor is on that is dope. They, I have to say, the promo shoot is always something fun to look for and see, yeah. you know, what the, try and guess what the theme is, especially. It never makes any sense mm -hmm. anymore. But it's, oh, yeah. And that's the sort of. What's so fun about it is that familiarity. Uh, you know, the first episode, they're going to walk in and say a line. They're probably going to have a photo shoot that throws them off. Yeah. Um, someone's going to cry about going home too soon. And there's going to be, you know, some sort of family revelation or something. And you're going to feel it the whole time. And I have learned to love so much pop music because it is a lip sync oh, yes. song from Drag Race. But and I was saying to Ben that, like, the best... Um, lip sync music is from UK, in my opinion. Like they have, yes. like do like just so good, so good. So I, I, I always pick it. Yeah. This link you sent us, Lexi, is is broken, unfortunately. Oh, no. oh that's too bad. Well, it's it's the most recent uh, photo of Soju, and I think it's really important to look at recent photos of some yes. of the queens, and then they're like, it's it's kind of like looking at the school photos when they're all like gangly and weird on their very first um, go through drag race because so many of them their drag just is so elevated after they're on the show even if they wind up being the first one out like one of the most successful queens ever mrs our mrs <laughs> miss vangie mateo yes! was first out and is like one of the most successful queens from that show so really? um everybody everybody wins she monetized her name before she even came back on the next season, just in case she did horribly the second time too, which is like genius marketing. I mean, yeah, to see the industry around Drag Race is so cool. And 
you know, like it, it felt like it's really suffered. I am, um, I'm still nervous about going out to bars and stuff, but like to see that drag con is happening again, to see that people have been really innovative about outdoor shows, digital shows, even like um, competitions have gone online in really cool ways. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Artists are going to diversify and figure out how to make it work, but it was definitely That's a question great. I had because the whole premise of this show is to find, you know, the next superstar drag queen. And I'm like, I'm, I'm curious if like, has that happened? Has that elevated? Oh, but it yeah, sounds like absolutely. beyond just finding the next superstar, what they've done is, is found a way to elevate everybody that hits the show. Yeah. And is able to like monetize. That. They changed the, the industry. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many TV shows and movies that have, um drag queens from rupaul's drag yes. race and just as characters and it's yeah. it's incredible and every so often we'll be watching a show and i'm like oh, that's monique yes. america my face is saying everything that you need to know dot com and it's just so incredible to see and like um people like bianca del rio has two movies that she made yeah. they're not great but they're not horrible das Vidania, texas bianca del rio's going to russia <laughs> a lot of fun um trixie mattel has this like incredible like career ooh, trixie has an incredible music career i'm the best folk drag musician and the only folk drag musician <laughs> and has recently purchased um a hotel and is running like a trixie mattel resort so yeah there's a hundred percent and also has a famous seven season tv show on youtube yep. that was optioned by yep. uh vice for a while and showtime also has um is hosting a spin-off music competition for drag queen created by world of wonder i mean world of wonder as a production yep. company which creates drag race um has really they i mean they own my youtube homepage for stuff that i'm watching but also um the the two creators fenton and i forget the other guy they have been queer creators supporting drag and and gender non-conforming people their entire careers so to see that like they found a way to make money i mean drag con happens in two cities at least in canada it also happens internationally i mean yeah, they they found a way to dominate every industry while also creating an entire new one. Um, Jada and, and making a space for themselves. Yeah, I mean Jada and Shay have walked in in well, so many queens have walked in shows. Space, Miss Fame, yeah. Aquaria, yeah. I mean, like for years now, um, drag music is its own genre. But yeah, someone like yeah. Trixie Mattel is actually dominating country music, which, like, as a queer man in a dress, is kind of unbelievable and revolutionary and indigenous. Yeah, right? absolutely. And like what a great! I yeah. love the way she also speaks about her indigeny and and like the the privilege she has as a person who looks moves through the world looking like a white man and is not just um yeah i think i think she just really handles that so well drag race it's sort of hard to not get happy and feel uplifted and good about it because it's it's doing something i mean it's having it's guiding these really cool conversations for sure mm -hmm. and i think in, in really cool productive loverly kind of ways Agreed. I mean, I can't think of any better way to uh, kind of sum up and go out of this episode than, than that beautiful sort of succinct button on Drag Race. Well, I mean, there's just the one way we have to. Lexi knows. If you can't love yourself, how, how in the hell are you going to love somebody else? I love it. Can we get an amen? Amen. Yes. <laughs> We're going to teach you, Ben. Let the music play. <laughs> Dan. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Hey, we really appreciate it. Is there anything else that you would like to plug? Any projects you got going on? Anything you want people to check out? Go watch some Drag Race. It will make you feel good and you will love it. And uh, You want people to find you somewhere? Or not oh, really? sure. Uh, I'm on Instagram at uh, MixKMcN, M-X-K-A-I-N-C-N. It is my name, but like Ben said once, it also kind of looks like Heineken. I, it's, that's yeah. not what it is, though. So. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, thank you so much for It can be read in many different me. ways. <laughs> so many that ways. That was a blast. Kay, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Thanks, bye. Dork, 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 dork. Dork, dork. dork. Thanks for listening to Dork Matters. If you like the podcast, subscribe, give us a rating, and tell your friends about us. If you are a fellow dork and have a dork issue that you think we need to discuss, tell us on our social media. 
You can find us on Instagram and Twitter. You can also check out original art and other content from Ben and myself. We'd like to say a big thank you to Yabra for the use of our theme song, Dance, off of their Astral EP, as well as a thank you to Jess Schmidt for producing and editing our podcast. Thanks, Jess. Dork Matters. This podcast is created on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Nations, which includes the Siksika, the Begaini, and the Gaina. We also acknowledge the Stony Nakoda Nation, Sutena, and Métis Nation Region 3. For all of us here at Dork Matters, Dork, 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 Dork